A mystery surrounds the birth of Genghis Khan, the creator of the Mongol Empire and one of history's most formidable conquerors. His death is much more of a mystery than his own murky beginnings. His passing was recorded in 1227, but the circumstances surrounding it are unknown. The Khan of Khans, according to some accounts, was killed after he was thrown off his horse and severely injured. Some say he died of malaria, while others say an arrow wound to the knee killed him. The same is true of where he was laid to rest. Genghis Khan's untimely demise is steeped in mystery. Genghis Khan, unlike many other world leaders, was not buried in a grand mausoleum. According to urban legends, he was buried in a secret spot and anyone who discovered his grave was assassinated. The tomb of the Khan of Khans was not discovered until recently despite dozens of archaeological digs. Is Genghis Khan's undiscovered tomb a hidden treasure? Join us as we explore the tomb of Genghis Khan, the warrior who ruled the world while mounted. When he passed away, the legend truly began. Almost every written record and oral history recounts an entirely different set of events. There is consensus, however, that Genghis Khan was buried in Mongolia and that his closest retainers, who may have been murdered to protect their master's secret, destroyed any evidence of his burial site. Finding where Genghis Khan was buried requires consulting a small number of primary documents written during his lifetime. It's worth noting that many of the most reliable biographies of Genghis Khan barely touch on the subject of his death. If you look at the oldest document written in Mongolian, The Secret History of the Mongols, all it says about the Khan's death in 1227 is that he ascended to heaven. There are rumors that the Khan himself ordered his death to be kept secret so that his opponents couldn't capitalize on the situation. According to legend, the great Khan requested to be buried atop Burkhan Khaldun, the holiest mountain in Mongolia. However, his gravesite was not mentioned. Genghis Khan hoped no one would ever track him down. The media sometimes portrays this reluctance as a curse, a fear that the end of the world would occur if Genghis Khan's tomb is unearthed. Born about 1162 on the banks of the Onan River, the future great Khan of the Mongols was given the name Temujin, which means of iron or blacksmith. Temujin had to face the harsh realities of life on the Mongolian steppe at a young age. When he was nine years old, his mother and seven siblings were left to fend for themselves after rival Tatars poisoned his father. Temujin learned to hunt and forage as a child, and he may have killed his own half-brother over a food disagreement when he was a teenager. The clan that had abandoned him had once caught and enslaved him, but he managed to break free. With his wife, Borta, whom he wed in 1178, Temujin had four boys and an untold number of daughters. After Borta was abducted, he conducted a daring rescue mission to free her, and he quickly began forging alliances, earning a reputation as a fierce fighter and amassing a growing number of followers. Contrary to tradition, Temujin promoted trusted associates over blood relations, eliminated the heads of other tribes, and assimilated the rest into his own family. He divided his men into units of ten without regard to kin, and he ordered all looting to be postponed until after a decisive victory. Despite Temujin's animist beliefs, he attracted adherents from a wide variety of faiths. By the year 1205, he had defeated all of his enemies, even his dearest friend Jamuka. A nation roughly the size of contemporary Mongolia was formed the following year, after he convened an assembly of representatives from all parts of the territory. Chinggis Khan, which means universal ruler, was another title bestowed upon him. The Western world knew him as Genghis Khan, however. Genghis Khan ruled over a population of about a million after uniting the tribes of the steppe. He did this by doing away with hereditary aristocratic titles, which were one of the root reasons for tribal strife. To add insult to injury, he also made it illegal to enslave a Mongol and made it a capital offense to steal animals. Genghis Khan also mandated the use of writing, established annual censuses, provided diplomatic protection to visiting ambassadors, and legalized religious freedom centuries before these innovations became commonplace elsewhere. Genghis Khan's first overseas war was in northwest China, against the Shishia Empire. The Mongols, after a string of invasions, made a big push in 1209, eventually reaching the outskirts of Yinchuan, the capital of the Shishia. 
The Mongols were unique among armies in that they didn't bring any supplies with them other than a big number of horses. The cavalrymen in the army were skilled riders and lethal with bow and arrow. The Mongols used their hallmark false withdrawal strategy at Yinchuan before laying siege to the city. The Shishia ruler bowed and paid tribute despite their failed attempt to drown the city. After the leader of the Jin dynasty in northern China made the mistake of requesting Genghis Khan's submission, the Mongols launched an attack on the region. The outnumbered Mongols destroyed the countryside and drove hordes of refugees into the towns from 1211 to 1214. The Jin army starved to death as a lack of food caused mass starvation. When the Mongols attacked Zhongdu, present-day Beijing, in 1214, the Jin emperor gave them a great quantity of silk, silver, gold, and horses as a peace offering. Zhongdu was sacked by Genghis Khan and his army with the support of Jin deserters when the Jin monarch relocated his court to Kaifeng, farther south. The modern-day countries of Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, and Iran were part of the Khwarezm Empire that Genghis Khan attacked in 1219. When the first caravan arrived, the merchandise was taken and the merchants were slain, despite the Sultan's agreement to a trade pact. The Sultan then ordered the execution of several of Genghis Khan's envoys. Despite being outnumbered, the Mongol horde continued to conquer Khwarezm cities including Bukhara, Samarkand, and Urgench. It was common practice to spare skilled laborers like carpenters and jewelers while eliminating nobles and rebellious soldiers. Meanwhile, Unskilled laborers were frequently utilized as human shields in preparation for the next attack. Due in part to the Mongols establishing their reputation for brutality as a means of intimidation, the exact death toll from Genghis Khan's wars remains unknown. Despite his prominence, relatively little is known about Genghis Khan's private life or even his appearance. There are no surviving pictures or sculptures of him from his time period, and the scant historical evidence we do have is often conflicting and suspicious. According to most reports, he was rather tall and muscular, with a full head of hair and a full bushy beard. Most surprisingly, the Persian historian Rashid al-Din from the 14th century writes that Genghis had red hair and green eyes. Although al-Din's account is dubious because he never actually met the Khan, it is possible that individuals with such stunning features existed among the ethnically varied Mongols. Genghis Khan forbade the creation of any kind of resemblance, including paintings, sculptures, and even coinage featuring his picture. The great Khan had a good eye for ability, and he frequently promoted his officers based on their abilities rather than their social status, family history, or even their allegiances. A famous incident that illustrates this belief in meritocracy occurred in 1201 when Genghis was nearly slain when an arrow shot out from under his horse during a battle with the enemy Taijut tribe. Later, when he spoke to the Taijut prisoners and wanted to know who had fired the shots, a brave soldier stood up and confessed. Genghis Khan was so impressed by the bravery of the archer that he made him an officer in his army and gave him the moniker Jebe, which means arrow, in memory of their first encounter in battle. Jebe would go on to become one of the Mongols' best field commanders throughout their invasions of Asia and Europe, alongside the renowned General Subutai. While Genghis Khan frequently offered other kings a smooth transition to Mongol authority, he was quick to use force against any society that refused to submit. In 1219, after the Shah of the Khwarezmid Empire betrayed a treaty with the Mongols, he launched one of his most infamous campaigns of vengeance. After the assassination of Genghis Khan's first ambassadors to the Shah, who had brought news of a lucrative commercial arrangement to facilitate the interchange of products along the Silk Road, the furious Khan sent the whole force of the Mongol hordes sweeping into the Khwarezmid domains in Persia. After the following war had destroyed the Shah's realm and killed countless people, the Khan continued his conquests. After conquering Khwarezm, he turned east and waged war on the Tanguts of Shishia, a people who were subjects of the Mongols but who had resisted his command to furnish men for his invasion of Khwarezm. After the great Khan's soldiers had defeated the Tangut and sacked their capital, the Tangut royal family was summarily executed for their resistance. The exact number of people killed during the Mongol invasions is unknown, but estimates range from 40 million to more than 100 million. 
Middle Ages censuses show that China's population dropped by the tens of millions during the Khan's reign, and experts speculate that the Khan may have been responsible for the deaths of as many as three-quarters of the people living in what is now Iran during his conflict with the Khwarezmid Empire. As much as 11% of the global population could have been killed off by the Mongols' raids. Genghis Khan was not like other empire builders in that he celebrated the unique cultures of his conquests. He enacted legislation guaranteeing everyone the right to practice their religion of choice and provided tax breaks to houses of worship. The Khan understood that content subjects would be less likely to rebel, but the Mongols also had an unusually tolerant outlook on matters of faith. Although Genghis and many others among the steppe peoples followed a shamanistic religion that honored the spirits of the sky, winds, and mountains, this group also contained adherents of other faiths, such as Nestorian Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, and other animistic practices. The Great Khan was deeply interested in spiritual matters himself. He frequently visited with religious leaders to debate the finer points of their faiths and was known to spend days praying in his tent before major battles. He reportedly invited the Taoist leader Chiu Chuji to his camp in his later years, when the two engaged in lengthy discussions about the nature of immortality and Taoist philosophy. The Mongols' extensive network of communication may have been as effective a weapon as their bows and horses. One of Khan's first orders was to establish a network of post buildings and way stations across the vast expanse of the empire for use by a mounted courier service he called the Yam. As much as 200 miles per day was possible for official riders if they stopped to rest or switch horses every few kilometers. Not only did the system facilitate the lightning-fast transport of commodities and news, but it also served as the Khan's watchful ear. The Yam made it simple for him to stay informed on military and political happenings and remain in touch with his vast network of spies and scouts. The Yam were also instrumental in safeguarding the trips of visiting foreign dignitaries and businessmen. Marco Polo and John of Plano Carpini were among the famous patrons of the service in subsequent years. Perhaps the most well-known mystery about the Khan's life is what became of him. According to legend, he died in 1227 after falling off his horse, but various additional causes, including malaria and an arrow wound to the knee, have also been attributed to his demise. Some versions of the story even have him trying to force himself on a Chinese princess before he is killed. No matter how he passed away, the Khan was very careful to conceal his burial site. Legend has it that his followers laid him to rest in a plain grave, but they made sure to mark the spot so that they could always return to honor their lord. They slaughtered a nursing camel calf and buried it close to the Khan's grave. His supporters were able to locate his tomb because every spring they would set free the mother camel, who would return to the location where she had buried her child. The mother camel passed away, and no one knew where the Khan was buried any longer. There is also the legend that in order to keep the location of the Khan's burial secret, the thousand troops who were tasked with bringing his body to its last resting place were massacred and thousands of horses tramped the area where he was laid to rest, leaving no sign of the tomb. Other accounts state that a forest was planted or a river was rerouted to cover up the location. After 800 years of digging by archaeologists, scientists, adventurers, and even thieves, Genghis Khan's tomb was finally located in August 2022. Workers in the Kenti province of Mongolia uncovered a mass burial of human remains resting on a stone structure while constructing a road close to the Onan River. Experts in forensics and archaeology have determined that the tomb dates back to the 13th century and that the body under the stone slab belonged to a man between the ages of 60 and 75 who died between 1215 and 1235 CE, making it a royal tomb in Mongolia. All indications point to Genghis Khan's ownership of the tomb, including its age, date, location, and lavishness. Slaves who worked on the tomb's construction were likely among the 68 skeletons discovered inside. They were likely killed to conceal the location. There was a tall male skeleton and 16 female skeletons inside the tomb. The women may have been the warlord's concubines and spouses whom he had murdered before he died. Thousands of cash and gold and silver items were strewn about the tomb. For decades, the rock dome lay hidden beneath the waters of the Onan River. 
The tomb's contents were substantially damaged due to the river's 18th century flow alteration. Does this information make Genghis Khan less mysterious? Does he grow less legendary and more human? You're wrong, and you should know it since his legacy will stand the test of time and will never be forgotten. During the 20th century, when the Soviets ruled Mongolia, it was illegal to even mention Genghis Khan, who is now revered as a national hero and the country's founding father. The Soviets attempted to erase any vestige of Mongolian nationalism by erasing the Khan's tale from textbooks and prohibiting visits to his birthplace in Kenti. Since Mongolia's independence in the early 1990s, Genghis Khan has been a popular subject for artists and cultural producers alike. Both the primary airport serving the capital city of Ulaanbaatar and the Mongolian currency bear the Great Khan's likeness. Genghis Khan's conquests brought together people from different parts of the world for the first time in history. Genghis Khan had a multifaceted personality, judging by the various accounts. He was physically powerful, focused on his goals relentlessly, and had an iron resolve. He was not a stubborn man who refused to take his wife's or mother's advice. He was quite adaptable. He was manipulative, but not a petty man. Genghis Khan accomplished great things. He rallied all the nomads and defeated huge empires like Khorezm and the even greater Jin Kingdom despite having a numerically inferior army. He did not, however, wear out his population. Genghis Khan did something unprecedented for the 11th and 12th centuries. He granted women full legal equality. Women were revered as family matriarchs, and property ownership was common even among widows. During his conquests, Genghis Khan granted women positions of leadership in both the military and administration. His abilities as a leader were superb. He led his troops by inspiring devotion through rewards and punishments. Genghis Khan allowed his warriors to rise in the ranks of government and society based entirely on their abilities, at a time when birth determined social standing and development everywhere else. He passed over a fully functional army and state to his son, Godai, whom he had carefully selected as his successor. Genghis Khan's generals had plundered Persia and Russia by the time he passed away, and he had unified the region stretching from Beijing to the Caspian Sea. His heirs would eventually rule over much of Russia, Iran, and China. They succeeded in welding their conquests into a tightly organized empire, something he apparently never intended to accomplish. People still remember the devastation wreaked by Genghis Khan, but it's important to note that this was just the beginning of the Mongol Empire, the greatest continental empire in history. Many of his offspring, such as Ogode and Kubilai, went on to become successful conquerors who spread their influence over the globe, extending to Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and even the remainder of China. Before their empire fell apart in the 14th century, the Mongols had overrun Japan and Java. The last direct descendant of Genghis Khan to hold power was overthrown in 1920. Genetic tests show that every fifth Asian and one in every 200 people in the world may be descended from Genghis Khan. So not only was Genghis Khan one of the most powerful individuals in human history, but he may also be your ancestor. Therefore, the finding of his tomb and the mysteries it may reveal have enormous consequences for all of humankind. Or what do you think? Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.